ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Anderson and Neil Ferguson. Thank you very much for being with us. The last time you and I spoke in your place, or your place of current residence uh, in the west coast of America, we were talking about freedom and the threats to the freedoms that we value and should value more. And you saw those threats in ascending order as being first, radical Islam. Secondly, the rise of China, a one party state, and the risk of miscalculation superpower versus the rising superpower. But thirdly and interestingly, I thought, fascinatingly, you said the greatest threat is our self-loathing and our lack of understanding of our own history. So cultural issues, if you like, what we've become now place our future in some jeopardy. Now, perhaps the most uh, respected and preeminent of Australian print journalists, the editor-at-large of The Australian here, Paul Kelly, wrote recently, and I thought those were very sobering words, if I can quote him, uh, said that it may not be possible for leaders to succeed in societies that have lost their traditional virtue and much of the civic glue that held them together. So to start off with a simple one, do we in the West individually and collectively need to rediscover those virtues? And I had to go and have a good look to make sure what the classic virtues were. Prudence, justice, temperance, and courage. Do we need to rediscover them? Virtues and, and I think civic glue is perhaps the more important uh, variable there. If you live in the United States, you're constantly assailed by the, the noise of the culture war. And the culture war is tearing America apart tearing it apart along multiple lines, racial, generational, gender, you name it, there's, there's a division that somebody's trying to exploit. And although these divisions are not new, what it, I think is new is a completely uncivil quality to discourse. The old rules of engagement, the rules of debate that I I suppose I, I grew up with in the west of Scotland, were that there were certain rhetorical rules, but generally speaking, an argument had to be supported by facts. In the culture war, that doesn't any longer apply. In the culture war, what you try to do is to destroy the reputation of the person on the other side. You simply attack their good faith, and it doesn't really matter what facts they may bring to the table. The, the question is simply one of, of the approving the, their, their bad faith. And I think this atmosphere is deeply unhealthy. It's very difficult to, to have a democracy function if it's being torn apart in this way and if rational argument is no longer a legitimate mode of settling differences. Uh, my wife is much more interesting and and wonderful than I'll ever be, Ayan Hirsi Ali said in a, in a recent speech in, of all places, Chile, that we no longer live in a democracy, we live in an democracy, where emotions trump facts. And I was profoundly struck by this. I wish I'd said it myself. Uh, and and I, I said, that's an amazing idea, because that, that's absolutely right. It's not a question of of being able to debate, of conventional debate in which arguments are deployed with, with evidence. It's now just whose emotion wins? Who is most upset? Uh, who has been most wronged? That's how we are now trying to settle issues. Issues often of great complexity. So I do think that, that he's right, that there's something amiss in the way that we, in the way that we debate. Now, virtues. The thing about virtues is that they are as perennial as vices. One of the hardest things to understand about human history is that there are certain things that are constant in the human condition, which enable us to understand Thucydides or Shakespeare. I 
I was recently re-immersing myself in Shakespeare as a kind of mental diet, really, mental cleansing or mental restoration. You know, stop listening to podcasts and watching your Twitter feed, listen to Shakespeare. And the most striking thing about about re-immersing myself in Shakespeare, which was was wonderful. I, I discovered lots and lots of old 1960s BBC recordings. Uh, you know, Paul Schofield as Macbeth. Was the realization that we can completely understand the dynamics of Macbeth. We understand Macbeth's somewhat unthinking ambition. And we understand Lady Macbeth's more intellectual ambition that self-destructs. We completely get Macbeth. I took our seven-year-old son to see Macbeth in London over the holidays, and he got it too. I mean, that's a long time ago. We're, we're talking about half a millennium apart. We understand the dynamics there. And yet we are playing out virtue and vice, ambition and revenge, hubris and nemesis in a technologically transformed landscape that Shakespeare would be baffled by were he to wander in and wonder what on earth we were doing. So I, I think that, that the key here is don't expect us to be more virtuous than the Elizabethans and, and don't expect us to be much worse than them. The, the virtues and the vices have been in this endless struggle over the centuries, that will never change. The question is whether we have institutions of civic life that encourage, incentivize us to behave virtuously. And that's, I think, the problem. Right. Uh, I think it was a colleague of yours, Thomas Sowell, who, who noted recently one of those sort of clever little lines that you hear occasionally. It's not that little Johnny doesn't know how to think. It's not that little Johnny doesn't know how to feel. The trouble is that little Johnny can no longer tell the difference. That's a perfect cue for a glass of scotch, don't you think? <laughs> I, I, I want to assure you that I'm having this for purely medicinal purposes because I have a slightly ticklish throat and only whiskey can prevent me from coughing convulsively. That is the only reason I'm drinking Laphroaig tonight. Laphroaig, a delicious Isla single malt, uh, my favorite. He's monopolizing it, I might add. <laughs> You, you're very welcome to have it, John, but, but I can't pour it into that glass because there's way too much water. Uh, well, whenever so. you're ready. <laughs> well, we had a good question on this question of, um, of, of feelings versus reality from Peter Madden, just back from a stint uh, in Ghana, uh, helping out with their economy and uh, prudential arrangements. Peter. My question, Adam Smith wrote the theory of moral sentiments before the wealth of nations. Smith recognized people in a community tend to share a sense of mutual sympathy for one another. I think this is what led to uh, trade and commerce. But after life in sub-Saharan Africa, I see the West is hyper-occupied with social, personal feelings, including in the workforce. From your writings on civilizations, the role of finance and economics generally. I'm interested in your thoughts on how does this new uh, moral sentiment look to be affecting uh, our social fabric? Thanks, Peter. Welcome, welcome back from, from Ghana. I, I think everybody, as part of a good university education, should read both the wealth of nations and the theory of moral sentiments. I, I grew up in, in Adam Smith land in Scotland and I remember one day I was ill and couldn't go to school and my father, who didn't really believe in illness in his own children, he was a doctor and he didn't regard illness as legitimate uh, in his own children, came in before he went to work and handed me a copy of the wealth of nations with the words, you'd better read that. Uh, he never handed me the theory of moral sentiments, and I came to that book much later. But it's a natural companion uh, to the wealth of nations. And the key point to understand is Smith's observation that one can't regard the market economy in isolation. It's embedded in civil society. And we can't really have a functioning market economy based on exchange without trust and, and empathy in particular, which is a really key idea in, in Smith's thinking. So we all need to make sure we don't just read the wealth of nations. I sometimes think a generation of economists 
were only really thinking about the wealth of nations. I'm not sure they even read the book, but they kind of read the Wikipedia summary and not realizing that, that if you just do a market economy without civil society, it's unlikely to work. This, this is really well illustrated by what happened in the uh, Russian economy after the Soviet collapse. Uh, the political scientists and economists who rushed over to advise the Russians essentially said, well, all you have to do is very simple, hold elections and, and then have a stock market and done. And they, they didn't realize that in the absence of, I mean, there was no civil society in the rubble of the Soviet Union. If all you do is, is elections and privatization and the stock market, then pretty quickly the oligarchs are in charge because there wasn't that foundation of civil society that did still exist in a country like Poland that hadn't been under communist rule for so long. So, so this is, is a crucial insight that Smith, that Smith gives us and a reminder that we can't have economics without the, the social and, and cultural foundation within which a market economy can only function. It's the same really as the rule of law. You can't expect a market economy to function without the rule of law. So I, I, I guess that's really a, a really general and universally applicable insight. Now, if Smith were around today, he would have to write a different book and it would be called uh, The Theory of Moral Outrage, because the default setting for anybody wishing to uh, make a point uh, in politics today is outrage. One has to be in a state of, of moral indignation to, to get anywhere. Uh, and so, really, this is echoing what I, I said earlier, that the tenor of debate tends to be almost the opposite of that empathy and sympathy that that Smith saw as so central to a functioning society. If you really want to be outraged and get yourself worked up into a state of righteous indignation, you must first cut off the empathy. You must not attempt to see the other person's point of view because that, that would make it much harder to be outraged. Empathy is what a good parent teaches a child as soon as possible. Children don't start off very empathetic and you, you try to train them to be empathetic. You know, don't you think that, you know, Johnny really didn't particularly enjoy that punch you gave him on the nose? I, I say that to Thomas on a regular basis and gradually Thomas has acquired, has acquired empathy. He'll lose it again when he becomes a teenager, of course, but you know, you, you, you live in hope that you'll Im embed it. But I have a sense that the, the social justice warriors of American campuses are, are engaged in some rather different process to try to stamp out empathy. Don't, for heaven's sake, put yourself in the position of somebody who voted for Donald Trump. Because if you were to empathize for a moment with their position as, say, a, a relatively unskilled, white working uh, class voter from middle America. If you were to empathize with them, you might forget for a second that they are nothing other than the instruments of white supremacy and the patriarchy to be crushed. So we are actually witnessing a sustained campaign against empathy in order to keep the level of moral indignation high enough for whatever goal is in, in the minds of the social justice movement. You touched on the issue of trust as being vitally important in this whole question of the relationship between, if you like, a civic society and good economic and political outcomes. There's research everywhere in this country demonstrating that Australians have lost trust in the system. Uh, the levels of distrust in our uh, politicians is at record levels. Uh, the lack of trust is at record levels. Uh, we've just had a Royal Commission of Inquiry into banking and financial services. Uh, we're confronting something like 70, 75 recommendations out of it. You could say it's a good thing we had it because it turned up all sorts of things that people were horrified by. You could say it's a good thing that there's recommendations. But the issue, it seems to me, is that every time trust breaks down and we find that people won't do voluntarily what we expect them to do, we rush for the rule book. We look to coerce them. And I actually have come to think that there's quite a relationship between the breakdown of trust uh, 
and the potential for the loss of freedom. Those new rules, the policing that will go with it, the censorious attitude that's developed, it will cost. It will cost. It will not be a good thing for our economy or for our society. It would have been far better if it had never been needed. The relationship between trust and freedom. Any thoughts? Many thoughts. Uh, Frank Fukuyama wrote a book about this years ago, I think in the 1990s. And I remember being very struck by the observation that, that trust is a kind of social capital that some societies have and, un and others don't. Uh, you know, Peter just was in Africa. There are some African societies where, where there really is almost no trust. Uh, and one relies on, on the Kalashnikov. Uh, rather than trust. I remember a friend of mine, a Chinese friend, saying, you know, the big difference between you guys, meaning Westerners, and us, is that your default setting is to trust someone when you meet them, and ours is the precise opposite. So I've thought a lot about How long this. ago did he say that? This was about 10 years ago. Uh, I wonder if he'd... I hope he'd still say it. Well, he said it in Singapore, not in mainland China, and yet he was from mainland China. I think if one looks at the decline of trust in institutions, because that's a different thing from trust in a stranger, there's been a steep decline in, in the trust that people feel in institutions in most developed countries. If you look at the polling on the United States, very few institutions have not seen a marked decline in trust over a 30 to 40 year time period, because we have Gallup data in the US going back to the 1970s. Uh, the decline in trust in Congress is very striking. I mean, it's been down in the single digits at some points in recent years. Uh, but you've also seen a decline in trust in the Supreme Court, and not surprisingly, perhaps the presidency, but that certainly predates Donald Trump. The military is an exception in the American case. Trust has actually risen in the military relative to the 1970s. Perhaps that's not surprising because the 70s was the time of Vietnam. There's still high levels of trust in the police. But most institutions have experienced a significant decline in trust. And amongst the worst non-political institutions uh, in these terms are the banks. Uh, journalists and the banks kind of vie to be bottom of the, the, the trust league table. Now, is this because people have, for whatever reason, withdrawn their trust capriciously? No, it's because the banks uh, and uh, indeed the media in most developed countries have lost people's trust by the way they've acted. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of the Australian banks, uh, but let's, let's look at the biggest banks uh, in the world and the ones that in many ways were the epicentre of the financial crisis, the American banks. They had behaved in a range of ways that were not illegal, uh, they were compliant with regulation, or at least the regulators tolerated them, but the consequences for ordinary people were catastrophic, not just because of the mis-selling uh, of financial products that were bad, but because the whole thing turned into a massive systemic crisis that nearly blew up the world economy the way the 1929 crash did. We, we had a very close shave. I mean, you've kind of forgotten it now, but there nearly was a Great Depression because of the way the banks were run. And I wrote a book about this, the ascent of money, and spent some time thinking about what had happened. And one of the striking features, and this goes to your, your question, John, about the banks, is that they were actually the most regulated entities in the US financial system on the eve of the crisis. People had worried that hedge funds would cause the next financial crisis, um, or the unregulated derivatives markets. No, no, it was the highly regulated banks, which a whole bunch of regulators were supposed to be watching over. And it hit me as I was writing The Ascent of Money that the culture of banking had fundamentally changed over the 20 or so years before the financial crisis from a, a culture which was based on informal understandings and relatively light supervision in which you tried to do the right thing to a culture in which you simply complied with the regulation. Are we compliant is a very different question from are we doing the right thing. I read a biography of a man named Sigmund Warburg, a really unusual figure in financial history because he didn't really mean to be a banker. He was really a, a scholar intellectual who'd become a banker because of the way the Nazis had forced him from his uh, German homeland. and He started over in, in, in London and he built a financial 
business, S.G. Warburg, that was fundamentally based on his own sense of integrity. And Warburg was the kind of person, if he didn't like the look of somebody, wouldn't do business with them no matter how much money they had. Robert Maxwell walks into Warburg's and walks out again, and Warburg says, we will have nothing to do with that man. That scene in which a, a, a moral judgment is made about a, a potential relationship, that kind of scene had simply ceased to happen on Wall Street by 2006, seven. The only question was, are we compliant? Can we do this? Can we do this? Is this okay? And that's a completely different mindset from the one that Warburg saw as central to a successful functioning financial order. The bankers in America, and I think this was true even, perhaps even more true in Britain, lost the trust of people for a reason, and they have to win it back. And they're not gonna win it back in a hurry any more than the media companies who've peddled fake news, uh, misrepresented stories, opted for sensation over fact, any more than those media companies are going, going to win back trust. So let's not blame ordinary people for losing trust, whether it's in the US Congress or banks. They have every reason to have lost trust, and the institutions have got to win it back, and that's not going to happen overnight. The question of regulation is an interesting one, just as an aside. Uh, one of the institutions that came out of the recent inquiry, I think, with the most bloodied nose, frankly, was the AMP, Australian Mutual Provident Society. It was set up uh, quite a while ago um, uh, by a clergyman. And Geoffrey Blaney, one of Australia's most eminent historians, wrote of it that it was, became, after the church, as one of the greatest forces for economic and social good in the country. And it was trusted to an extraordinary degree. My point is that was happening in a day when there was very, very little prudential regulation indeed. They were simply trusted to do the right thing without coercion. Well, the problem is that in the aftermath of the crisis, and I imagine it will be true in the aftermath of this commission, what people say is, well, look how dreadful these people are. What can we do about it? Well, we really must regulate them more tightly. So let's have even more regulation with even more detailed uh, prescription of this or that bad practice, let's have it run to hundreds, no, thousands of pages. I mean, certainly the re regulation that was produced in the US after the financial crisis is enormously long and complex. And, and surely once we've written a, a regulation for every possible misdeed, uh, then good behaviour will ensue. And this is just an amazing illustration of our ability ability as human beings to keep doing the wrong thing in the face of all experience. Because clearly the more complex the regulatory framework, the more the mentality becomes, are we compliant? And can we game this? So the big problem with regulation is not just the, the unintended consequence that people stop asking, is this the right thing? They just ask, is it compliant? There's another problem. Uh, and, and that is that the big players are actually protected by complex regulation and new entrants are excluded. Because if you want to run a bank in the United States today, you need a compliance department the size of 10 times this room. If you want to be a new bank, for a starter bank, forget it, because the costs of that compliance department are going to stop you getting off the ground. No new banks were formed in the United States for 10 years after the crisis because it was too difficult to start a new bank. Never in American history has there been a period after a crisis when no new banks were formed. So regulation has this double downside. The more complex it is, the more it actually protects the incumbents and reduces competition. So we need to fundamentally rethink the idea that if there's a problem, we can fix it with regulation. The only law of history is the law of unintended consequences, and it really applies in this domain. I wrote a book about this called The Great Degeneration. I wish it had been more widely read and its lessons applied. I'm sure it sold very well in Australia. Well, I Have don't know how well it sold in, uh, in Australia, but may, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe tonight we'll give it a last boost recommend in it. sales. I recommend it. It's not even a long one. It's my shortest, it's my shortest book, but... Of One what? of its central themes is that regulation is the disease of yeah. which it pretends to be the cure. Yeah. Carl Krauss was a brilliant Viennese satirist who was my hero when I was an undergraduate at Oxford. Krauss said that psychoanalysis was the disease of which it pretended to be the cure. So I adapted this to regulation. And it is true. I mean, the, the, the reality is the financial crisis arose from the way that the regulatory system was so complex that nobody really applied the rules. And we've made it even more complex. Luckily, luckily, the Trump administration actually moved to simplify.
the regulation. And guess what? Banks are once again being created. But, but I do think that the law of unintended consequences in the realm of regulation is not well understood. And voters are still rather inclined to respond to the sensational news that bad people did bad things in financial institutions by saying, something must be done about this. That something should probably be regulation. And politicians feed this, and journalists feed it. I mean, Paul Krugman, an American journalist who used to be an economist, has uh, often argued that the financial crisis all happened because of, of deregulation, which is absolutely not true. And therefore, the solution must be more regulation. But that, that kind of argument plays well. And voters are kind of, oh, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, probably if there were no regulations, they were bad. Therefore, what we need are regulations. But, but it's actually completely the wrong way of thinking about the problem. What's needed is simple regulation, very, very simple regulation, and then regulators with discretion. There were not complex regulations in the financial system that Walter Badgett wrote about in the late 19th century. In fact, the remarkable thing about the extraordinarily complex system that operated out of London in the late 19th century was how little regulation there was. But it worked pretty well. And that's precisely the point. Simplicity of regulation, powerful discretionary oversight. That's what a financial system needs. And surely a culture that recognises trust is integral to our freedom. And, and that trust is good for business. Because if institutions are competing to win trust, then you end up in a much better place. If the question becomes, how can we win the trust of our customers back, not how can we fleece the suckers, you get a very different outcome. So I do think that we, do, we need to get back to some of the key insights of the, the laissez-faire era, but don't kid ourselves. Laissez-faire doesn't mean it's a free-for-all. There, there were powerful regulatory instruments, mostly wielded in those days uh, before the First World War by the Bank of England, the phenomenon of the governor of the Bank of England's eyebrows, you may be aware of, that the governor of the Bank of England, by moving his eyebrows, could have a profound effect on the behavior of an institution. And I, I've always tried to persuade my American economics friends, you know, I know you guys love rules, but actually what Walter Badger is saying is not that you need very rigid rules. You, you need actually powerful regulators with discretion. Of course, those regulators need to have some, some ethical sense themselves. But, but I think for the Victorians, that was self-evident. Neil, to change gears and go back for a moment to civic glue. Uh, as we look in this country to America, and we certainly have uh, since the Second World War, as our great protector and our great friend, and as uh, uh, I think, um, as sometimes said, uh, we mightn't uh, always uh, be totally comfortable with the way they go about things, but there are no great issues we can resolve the, uh, without the help of the Americans. Um, it really does look to us, though, that the civic glue that bound it together and made it so successful is dissolving. And I just want to ask you, Trump is often depicted, I think, as the problem uh, by many, but it seems to me that in many ways he's more the product rather than the cause of that tribalism and that distrust and that division that now so blights Western countries and his own, of course, America. Yeah, that's clear. Charles Murray wrote a brilliant book called Coming Apart, which I think was published in 2011 or there and then about. And Charles argues in it that the United States is experiencing social polarization between a, a cognitive elite in the super zip codes that has absolutely nothing to do with uh, a lower class that uh, is ex largely culturally uh, sealed off from, from the elite. And, and Coming Apart was a remarkably prescient book, a brilliant book. If you read Coming Apart, you saw Trump coming because you understood that the, the polarization had created a fundamental sense of alienation amongst uh, the latter group. I think Trump was a manifestation of the kind of social problems that Charles Murray wrote about in Coming Apart. It was not difficult to see in the course of 2016 that for people in the so-called flyover states, for middle America, for non-college educated uh, white Americans, uh, 
there was something so badly wrong with the political system as personified by Hillary Clinton that you needed somebody to come and, and disrupt it. Uh, the, the two things that most neatly summed up Trump's appeal uh, was said to me by a wonderful man, Jerry Blake, who was one of my wife's security detail. And Jerry is, uh, is no fool. He's a former New York Police Department detective. He previously was in the Marine Corps. He did not go to college, but Jerry is no fool. And as a New Yorker, Jerry knows quite a lot about Donald Trump's defects because you would have had to be blindfolded with noise canceling headphones on as a cop in Jerry's time not to know about Donald Trump's defects. Jerry uh, was the first person to explain to me in early 2016 that Trump was going to win. It's going to be, it's going to be Trump, Neil. It's going to be Trump. I'm like, Jerry, come on. Give me a break. All my Harvard professor friends say he has no chance. <laughs> and Jerry's like, yeah, really? Uh, and Jerry said, because, uh, because he tells it like it is. He tells it like it is, which meant he talks like me and, and my mates. He doesn't talk like a professional politician with eight talking points that they memorized before they went on TV. And the second thing was even more telling. He said, Neil, he's going to shake things up. He's going to shake things up. And I thought, that's it. He, he, he's voting Trump for disruption. Trump's a wrecking ball. From Mike and Jerry, the political system had become so disgusting, uh, Hillary Clinton so personified all that they hated about the elites, their hypocrisy, you know, oh, climate change in the private jet, climate change in the private jet, their inability to speak in normal American English, that it was necessary to bring in Donald Trump and blow the whole thing up. So I, I think you are absolutely right, John. This is, was a symptom of underlying divisions that had reached breaking point. It took me months to realize that Jerry was right. I mean, I had this kind of learning experience in, in 2016, we'll maybe come back to it uh, during Brexit. And I came out of Brexit and I thought, okay, now I get it. Because the Jerrys of Britain had voted for Brexit. And gradually it came, became clearer and clearer to me that, that this was gonna happen. And from the point of view of Jerry, there wasn't gonna be a miracle. All the manufacturing jobs were not magically gonna come back. Trump was not gonna be some superhero. Jerry had no illusions about uh, Trump and understood that the probabilities of making America great again were not 100%. But the point was to take this chance, to take this chance on disruption because it was preferable to the continuation of the same old, same old, the Clintons, I mean, the choice they were initially presented with, would you like a Clinton or a Bush? <laughs> which, which dynasty would you like your next president to be from? And the revolt was essentially against that. And it was as much a revolt against the Republican establishment as it was a revolt against People the Democratic People do forget establishment. that. It's an important oh, point. Absolutely. It started as a revolt against, uh, against Jeb Bush, against all the Republican establishment, against the neoconservatives. That's where it began. It was actually, so, in some ways, less important, the revolt against the Democratic establishment. The big revolt was the one that got him the nomination. So yeah, I think all of that is right. And most of the things that people try to blame on Trump, oh, our terrible, toxic political atmosphere. I mean, come on, it was already there. The polarization, you can measure that, it was already there. The divisions were already painfully obvious that you know, academic America had completely cut itself off from middle America. I can give you an illustration of this. Uh, there was a, an academic group on a campus close to me that had a conversation along the lines of, I wonder if anybody here has ever, you know, met a Trump supporter? <laughs> and somebody said, actually, uh, I am a Trump supporter. And it was like one of those Bateman cartoons where everybody goes, ah! <laughs> because it never occurred to them that in their community of bien pensant professors, there might actually be a Trump supporter. The question was, had anybody met one? So that level of distance, that complete isolation of, of the academic elite from the rest of the country was part of the, the pathology that Trump was elected to deal with.
Tell me something, you often uh, make the comment that the six killer apps that the West has that make it more successful, one of them is free speech, it allows for free debate, for the testing of ideas, the rejection of bad ones, uh, for innovation. At the very least, it seems to me that Trump, by saying the unthinkable, according to the elites, that happened to accord with what people in the street were thinking, surely it's been, if nothing else, good for free speech. It's interesting that Trump recently opened up a new front uh, in that debate by saying in a, in a speech that he gave at, uh, uh, at APAC that he was going to come after colleges that didn't allow free speech on campuses by withdrawing federal funds. That was a very interesting development that he should weigh into that debate. If you take a step back... Obviously, it is a reality that free speech has become more circumscribed on American campuses. It is also becoming more limited on the, on the internet, and there's no question that the skew is against the right rather than against the extremes on the left. Trump's contribution is an interesting one because one defining feature of, of Trump's uh, discourse is that it is not very truthful. Uh, and the president has a relationship to truth that is casual uh, at best, but, and so endless op-eds get written about, ah, this is the 1,913th lie that Trump has uttered since becoming president, and, and that is true. He certainly uh, is not somebody famed for his veracity, but there are certain truths that Trump has uttered that are in some ways more politically salient and important than his many, many untruths. And I, I think people forget that the substance of Trump's campaign was more important than the style. The style was important. He tells it like it is, that mattered. But if it had just been Trump kind of winging it like a guy in a bar who's had a couple of drinks, that wouldn't have been enough. There was content there, uh, and it was powerful and important content. So Trump essentially observed that uh, the, the problems of middle America were consequences of globalization that had gone too far, that there would, had been uh, uh, unrestricted migration, sub including substantial illegal immigration in previous years, and that had impacted uh, the lives of, of ordinary Americans, that Chinese competition and the outsourcing and manufacturing jobs to China had been something that had affected the lives of ordinary Americans, and that America's trade deals had not been fair deals that actually been harmful to the United States. And I think that's the key to Trump's victory. Both parties had signed up, essentially, to the ideology of globalization and free trade, and you weren't allowed to criticize that. And Trump was regarded as a complete maverick for starting to talk about tariffs and saying that the Chinese were guilty of, of bending the rules. But it was true. And it was absolutely true that globalization had been very beneficial for the 1% at the top of the income distribution and actually not that great for ordinary Americans. That was true. And because Trump was the first politician to come out and say it, to challenge the globalization consensus, that was why he won. So, yeah, lots of little lies about Stormy Daniels and much else. But the key truths about the situation of the median American household. Those were the things that got him elected, not the lies. So that feeling of alienation, of not being heard, so on and so forth, plays out in the form of a controversial president blowing things up. The other side of the Atlantic, it results in Brexit. They tell us a lot about the price we pay when trust breaks down, when we stop understanding others and their perspective, when they feel alienated from their own society from their own leaders. You yourself um, had uh, something of a change of views on Brexit, but what does it tell us and how do you see it unfolding now? Brexit was suddenly clear to me one night in a pub in South Wales. Uh, the Prince of Wales, which is a wonderful pub, uh, my favorite pub in the world. And I was sitting in the Prince uh, a week or so before the referendum, and I should make it clear, I was on the side of Remain. I was against uh, Brexit, and I'd, I'd written a variety of articles and given interviews and speeches, and the core of my argument was essentially, this is divorce, 
and divorce costs a lot more and takes a lot longer than you think when you start out. Any divorcees here? Anybody want to disagree with that? It's certainly not easy. And I also felt politically that the consequence of the referendum going for Brexit would be the fall of David Cameron, the Prime Minister that I thought was talented, and I had the strong suspicion that the beneficiary would be Theresa May, about whom I had a much lower opinion. So I had my practical political reason. Two, I'm sitting in the pub in South Wales, and I am next to a man I don't know. And he's introduced to me as the man who owns the biggest liquor store off license, what do you call them here? Place that sells booze uh, in Bridgend. And I go, oh, very nice to meet you. And he says, do you know, do you know the most popular beers we sell? And, um, you know, conversations are always interesting in the Prince of Wales. So I go, no, tell me. What are the most popular beers that you sell? And he says, Polish and Lithuanian beer. And I'm, oh, well, I said, very naively, that must make you a big supporter of Remain if your principal customers happen to be employees from the new member states of the European Union working in Britain and spending their hard-earned money in your store. And he looks at me as if I'm completely demented. He says, no, I ain't for Brexit, because it just shows how much bloody money they're making here. <laughs> now, the whole basis of the Remain campaign was that Brexit was going to be expensive. And George Osborne, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, and his mandarins at the Treasury had calculated exactly how much it was going to cost every single Briton to the last penny. And I said to George, we have a problem because they don't care about the cost. They, the guy in the bridge end off license doesn't want to be selling beer to Polish and Lithuanian workers. So Brexit wasn't about economics. Brexit was not about economics. It was about immigration, mainly. And, and not prejudice. It wasn't that he had any prejudice against the Polish and Lithuanian buyers of beer. In fact, the striking thing about Brexit is it's kind of racism free because, I don't know if you've ever been to Poland or Lithuania, but people from Poland and Lithuania look exactly like people from South Wales. In fact, you couldn't tell them apart. So this couldn't really be interpreted as racism. It was just the sense that too many people were coming to South Wales or for that matter, the Southeast of England. And, the usual arguments about, you know, services are overstretched, which they always are uh, in the case of the National Health Service. And crucially, this is a thing that I learned in the last couple of years. People don't vote about past immigration. They vote about future immigration. And the reason that Brexit happened was not the Poles and Lithuanians that were already there. It was the perception that many, many more people were going to come. Why? Because the German government had just let 1.3 million people into Germany, mostly as it happened from Muslim-majority countries, in an extraordinary policy volt fast by Angela Merkel. And the killer argument, and I heard it more than once in pubs up and down the country, was, so Neil about the 1.3 million people that they've just let into Germany. If they get German passports, can they come here? And the only honest answer to that was yes. So that was the essence of Brexit. And I can remember realizing that this was a problem and the conversation went something like this. We should talk about immigration. That's all anybody cares about. No, we can't go there. So the campaign was don't talk about immigration, just talk about the economy. And the great British public was, we don't care about the economic costs of this. That's not the point, mate. It was very unlike the Scottish independence referendum, which I've also been involved in. If you tell the Scots, uh, this is going to cost an awful lot of money, they're like, <laughs> OK, forget it. <laughs> English aren't like that. And so, you know, the mistake that David Cameron and George Osborne made was they tried to play the same game as they'd played in the Scottish referendum by saying to English and Welsh voters, Oh, this is going to cost a lot of money. And the English voters said, we don't care. Do it. And sure enough. The problem was that 
on the one hand, I was right. It is like divorce. It's very costly, more costly than you expect. It takes longer than you expect. It's not necessarily the solution to all your problems. But as a friend of mine said after I published that particular article, yes, Neil, but you did get divorced. And yeah, Britain is getting divorced. And it's just as messy as uh, my divorce was. But when you are finally confronted with the divorce terms, years after you embarked on the process, and you think exactly the way people reacted to the withdrawal agreement when Theresa May brought it back. I mean, I can remember the night this thing dropped. Everybody's reading it going, holy expletive, this is terrible. And it was, I felt exactly the same way about the terms of my divorce. I'm like reading it going, oh no, oh God, the backstop, which was the key problem for many people. The backstop with respect to Ireland, it's like the terms that govern your children under a divorce. And you're kind of looking at it going, no, no, but it's, that's it, that's the divorce. There isn't another better divorce available. And that's why I think eventually some version of this gets done because that's what divorce is like. I mean, it's awful. But I think Britain ultimately needed to get divorced from the European Union. And I, I came round to the view that actually the English and the Welsh voters were right. Why? Because, because the project of a federal Europe is not something the United Kingdom can be part of. It just isn't. And that's really what Europe's leaders have been bent on since the 1980s. That's what Maastricht was about, it was what the Monetary Union was about. I mean, they didn't do the Monetary Union because they thought it would be cute to have Euros. They did it in order to further the cause of a federal Europe. They did it so that eventually, after a crisis, everybody would say, OK, we better have a federal budget as well. And that's exactly where the French President Macron is, you know, now you see, you need a budget. So the inexorable moves towards a federal Europe are carrying on much as Mar Margaret Thatcher came to see late in her term in office, they would. So Britain at some point was going to have to get out because there's no way Britain is going to be a federal state in a, in a European United States of, of, of Europe. And I, I've come to realise that yeah, I was probably on the wrong side of that argument. And David Cameron was too, because what he should have done, when the Europeans came back, as they did in, what was it, February of 2016, with terrible terms, like, we'll make the following concession to you. You can have one tiny little bone that size. When they did that, which was on a question of immigration, he should just have said, actually, that's not good enough, so I'm backing Brexit. That was his fatal mistake, not calling the referendum. The fatal mistake was not to say to the Europeans at that moment, OK, if that's the best you can do, I'll back Brexit. If he'd done that, he would still be Prime Minister. As you say, uh, it was more about immigration uh, and future immigration than economics, but Hannah had a question that goes to the economic issues. Well, wonderful to be here both with you, Niall, uh, Neil and... Uh, John. So the last six months of British politics have been dominated by the seemingly futile quest for an exit deal with the EU. How important is it for Britain's economic future that it leaves with a deal or can it go it alone in the global economy? Thanks, Hannah. I think the no deal scenario uh, is not a realistic one where you say, well, in that case, we're just going to crash out without any agreements or understandings about how trade between Britain and Europe will be conducted. And I, I, I think that would have been like me at some point in divorce, just tearing it all up and saying, well, I'm just going to walk out. I mean, the truth is you can't really do that under these circumstances because economically that would be very disruptive for a time. I think the people who argue for that are being disingenuous about how disruptive it would be and how ordinary people would be affected in a way that they haven't been thus far. Because thus far, actually, normal service has been maintained. But hard no-deal Brexit would be a complete disruption of cross-channel traffic, air uh, traffic. It would be, I'm absolutely sure, a self-inflicted disaster. So I, I think you've got to have to do the divorce that you negotiated, for better or for worse, for all its imperfections, this is it. This is what's available. This is what she negotiated. Probably there could have been a better deal with a better prime minister, but this is it. I don't think it's a futile quest, though, to come back to 
what I said earlier. I think Britain needs to follow through on this. The proponents of Brexit need to recognise that there was never going to be a perfect Brexit. I'm very suspicious of people. And there are clearly some people in the European Reform Group who, having come thus far, would like Brexit to fail so that they can say, well, you see, Brexit was never done. If only it had been done, we'd be in a better place. If that's their game, that they're going to just claim that Brexit would have been wonderful if only it had been done, then I want no part of that. They made this happen. They campaigned for it. They greatly understated the costs. They told fairy stories about money for the NHS. And this is the result. And they need to own it. And they need to make it work. I'm very against another referendum. I don't think that would be at all a good outcome. Imagine. Imagine if they held another referendum and Huge remain numbers one. of people are going to feel completely cheated, whatever Everybody the Everybody who voted for Brexit will never trust the established political system again. They will leave the Tory party en masse. Trust again. So it would break I, trust. I think, yeah. And, and you know, alternatively, if you'd rerun the referendum and they'd leave would win again, that, what would that achieve? So I think uh, we should dismiss the idea that there is some heroic Churchillian no-deal option. That is not nonsense. That is just recklessness and that's recklessness that will affect the lives of ordinary people uh, and by the way that too would lose trust if the conservative party presided over the kind of economic upheaval that a no deal brexit would cause they would forfeit the confidence of the public for a generation what's the alternative at this point uh, that would be jeremy corbyn the most left-wing leader the labor party's ever had so it's a matter of political responsibility not to make Brexit an economic disaster. Uh, that, that seems to me the, the strongest argument for getting this withdrawal agreement through with all its imperfections. Is she going to do it? She's so incompetent that she probably will fail again. What will then happen? Like students who haven't quite got the essay finished, they'll ask for an extension. And I always felt that two years was too little of time so it, you know getting divorced took me four and a quarter years as long as the first world war with very similar results <laughs> <laughs> and i think I, yeah i wouldn't be surprised if brexit takes another two years and then probably drags on after that with negotiations about the implications but that's what divorce is like and i just wish the people who who'd made it sound like it would be a quickie in vegas had been a bit more honest about what divorce was really going to be like coming to divisiveness and polarisation. The uh, Democrats, understandably, in America, accuse Trump of sowing division. You can't deny that in many ways he's been divisive. But their solution seems to me to look very much as though they think the answer is to move further left themselves. Surely uh, that in itself only exacerbates the very social polarisation uh, that they say they're trying to fix. That they're opposed what, to. Yeah, one of the things that, that I got right was that once you have the populism of the right, what tends to happen is that the next thing is the populism of the left. So you kind of swing all the way out here, and if it doesn't work out as well as you thought, you think, ah, I should have voted for Bernie Sanders. So it was not surprising to me that the Democrats began to shift left. Think what happened in Britain. No, no sooner had we embarked down this uh, road to Brexit than the Labour Party swung left and Jeremy Corbyn was leader and the next thing you know, he's appearing at Glastonbury and is for a brief and thankfully not too uh, serious moment uh, the, the most popular politician in Britain. We're now seeing the similar process unfolding in the United States in the rather more glamorous figure of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Alexandria occasionally correct, as I prefer <laughs> to call her. And uh, an AOC, which is easier to say than that long name, AOC is a very interesting figure because she has burst onto the scene with a set of radical policy recommendations of which the Green New Deal is the most uh, impactful, but, but actually it's, it's also her style that has been striking. Because what AOC has done is to learn uh, 
from Trump how you use social media for politics. That, that, that's the key to the new politics. There are two kinds of politicians now, that those who understand social media and those who lose. And she gets it. And the key to social media is not truth or facts, as she herself said, you know. It's all about being morally right, not factually right. And she's mastered this art that Trump uh, earlier mastered of being always in the news. Now, the way to be always in the news is to say things that aren't true, that then people say aren't true, and then you say, well, actually, I didn't really mean that, because that becomes news too. You say not only that you're going to stop American economic growth and, you know, essentially surrender economic leadership to China, which is what the Green New Deal would do. But then you issue a, an FAQ sheet that says you're actually going to abolish air travel and cows. Everybody, everybody's heads explode at this point. And you say, no, 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 we didn't really issue that. You try and unissue it. And everybody runs around for two days trying to find copies of the original FAQ. That's how you were in the news the whole time. Um, in some ways, AOC is a very Latin American figure. You know, the idea of being kind of hot and kind of really far left, that's a very Latin American idea that is new to Americans. Uh, because remember, up until now, being a socialist was Bernie Sanders, who is in all kinds of ways interesting, but not hot. So AOC is like, wait, socialism and hot. And this is kind of, for the American media, intoxicating. I mean, if you're from Argentina, it's like, ah, oh, not that again. Uh, not, not lipstick plus socialism. But, I, you know, I think it's going to be interesting where this leads. All candidates for the Democratic nomination have had to get on board at some level with the AOC Express. And the speed with which the front-running candidates endorsed the Green New Deal, which I prefer to call the Green Leap Forward, because of its Maoist implications, <laughs> was amazing. You should all call it the Green Leap Forward, by the way, because that is a good joke. And they all said they were in favour of it. Even though, if you look at it, it implies essentially zero growth for the US economy. I think she may turn out to be the greatest gift that Donald Trump has ever received. Because as these candidates move leftwards, because it it's the zeitgeist, we'd better get with it. Remember, all these kind of mainstream candidates, they're all baby boomers. Like, they're quite non-young. I can say this because I am a baby boomer, technically. The baby boomer generation stops in 1964, annoyingly, because <laughs> that was when I was born, so I'm technically a baby boomer. But so is Kamala Harris. And Elizabeth Warren, I think, is a senior um, so they're all like, oh, yeah, we're totally down with the uh, Green New Deal, which is hilarious when you think about what that's going to be like when one of them is the candidate and up against Trump and debates. I mean, he's just going to destroy. He's going to destroy them because socialism in middle America is an obscene word. I mean, you may be able to say socialism on the campus at Boston University where AOC apparently learned economics. I mean, I like teasing my colleagues at Boston University. It's like, she's one of yours, really? <laughs> so, so you can say, oh, I am a socialist. And everybody goes, oh, that is so woke. Have another latte. <laughs> but, but if you go anywhere inland and say the word socialism, they're like, did you just say socialism? <laughs> so, so the fact that they're having to endorse all this stuff I mean, it's just, it's just insane that the longest suicide note in history up until this point was the Labour Party manifesto of 83. They have come up with a longer suicide note. It's the Green New Deal. Uh, so, yeah, great. Carry on. Good this luck. <laughs> Good luck with this in 2020. Let's tease out something that's very important here. Um, now... Uh, you and I both, uh, we have children. I'm one step ahead of, of you. I've got grandchildren as well. I decided to have my own grandchildren and cut out the middleman. So I, <laughs> I have a 16-month-old son. Uh, I, and I told my eldest is 25, you're off duty. No rush. I have, I have this grandchild thing already done. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, but uh, both in Britain and America, you're sort of seeing this... Um, 
Attraction to young people who feel that their futures are being blighted. 92% of young Australians don't think they'll have the same economic opportunities as their parents had, and it's largely because of stagnant wages, rising asset prices, you know, for young people trying to buy their first residence in this country. It's a horrendous problem. So that's a, playing out here as it is in America. They're attracted superficially to these sorts of simplistic solutions, which ultimately must work against their very interests. Can we just tease out? I mean, plainly, economic growth is very strong in America at the moment, uh, although debt's exploding. Now, to go the Green New Deal would stall the growth, presumably, and push the debt through the roof, yeah. as if it wasn't already. Yeah. The biggest losers would be our children and grandchildren. They're the ones who are left with it. It's, if you like, a breaking of the contract, as Edmund Burke put, between, put it, I think, between you know, the living the yet to be born and those who have gone before us, I'm really exercised and I think you are too and motivated by this need to ensure that young people actually understand what baby boomers may be doing to them with ideas which sound good like free education or, you know, solving a climate change problem uh, but doing it in ways that actually will cripple their opportunities later on. What do we do about it? How so, do we... so those young Australians are right that they will be worse off than their parents if those policies are pursued. It's kind of guaranteed. Uh, I think that... They're young, they're idealistic, it, it looks grim, but how do we get over them that many of the solutions that are being put up are simply going to make it grimmer? The, the challenge here is that, firstly, we don't really teach young people about socialism. So if you actually knew anything about the history of socialism, which has been tried in many different countries in many different ways and has always failed, then uh, it would be unlikely to think it would be a good idea. There's a lot of confusion around what this word socialism means and it turns out when you actually quiz people that they're really just talking about Sweden uh, and the welfare state. And what they really mean is um, we'd quite like to have more redistributive progressive taxation um, and my response to that, or we'd like to have a different system of single-payer healthcare, and my response to that is, well, that's not actually socialism, because those policies were devised by Christian Democrats, as well as Social Democrats, after World War II, to prevent socialism from happening. So if, if that's what you're in favour of, then don't call it socialism, because that's a category error, because socialism is about the state controlling the means of production, and that state control designed to prevent free enterprise uh, has been a disastrous failure wherever it's been tried because it is a recipe for corruption and economic failure. And if you don't believe me, Venezuela is kind of that way. So please can we try to just have a little bit of conceptual clarity here. Point two, young people have not been well educated about fiscal policy and its distributional implications. In The Great Degeneration, I made the point that if young people understood their own self-interest in the United States, they would all have been fans of Paul Ryan's roadmap for entitlement reform, which never happened because entitlement reform was scrapped as an idea by Donald Trump. But entitlement reform is, is crucial because the main reason that the federal debt is growing inexorably each year is that there are a whole bunch of unfunded liabilities on Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid that we don't have any way of affording and the problem gets bigger with every passing year. The losers from these fiscal policies are clearly younger voters and, and the unborn. Larry Kotlikov, ironically, at Boston University, a professor of economics at Boston University, she must have taken none of his courses. That's the only explanation. Because Larry Kotlikov has argued for years that there's this massive generational imbalance and that what current policy does is to transfer resources from the young and the unborn to baby boomers and seniors in massive generational uh, inequity that, as you rightly say, John, violates Burke's uh, contract between the generations. They all ought to be right wing. They should be campaigning for entitlement reform. They should be campaigning for the kind of policies that would bring the debt under control. So there is what used to be called false consciousness at work here. Ironically, many young voters are lured into siding with the very interest groups that have their interests least at heart, e.g. public sector unions.
Now, public sector unions in most developed countries are the villains of the peace who want to create huge liabilities uh, in the form of pensions for their members to be funded by future generations of workers. But young people will be, for some reason, duped into aligning themselves with those very interests that have their, in their interests least at heart. So we've had a double failure of education. And I'm an education person. I've been a professor most of my career trying to teach young people. I've totally failed. Total and abject failure. I fail to communicate to more than a, must be a handful of people that socialism doesn't work and communism is a total disaster. I mean, it's just the extreme form. And I've failed to communicate to more than a very small number of people that the way that public finance works is deeply uh, against the interests of young people. And so I've kind of concluded that teaching doesn't work. There's more than a handful of young people here tonight. Are you you're convinced by what he's saying? I live in hope. <laughs> It, it's not because you took my classes if you've come round to this vantage point. So we, we, we have a problem and it's probably not that surprising because if, it, uh, let's face it, I'm rather an unusual figure in the academic world. Most universities are not teaching people what socialism is really like and most universities are not teaching people to think about public finance in a rational way because most universities are staffed by liberals, progressives and socialists and there are no conservatives left pretty much. So we can't be surprised if the young are wandering around with stars in their eyes about, about redistributive policies and cancelling student loans and free this and free that. I mean, that's, we educated them to think that way. On the, uh, the issue of um, <coughs> social activism on the part of people who if you like, uh, have come to have their doubts about capitalism and business is not in good standing in this country. I will say that. I don't think anybody would dispute it. We've got some magnificent business leaders, but by and large, um, they seem to know that they're not liked. So they're out there saying, well, we'll put our core responsibilities to our shareholders to one hand uh, uh, behind us and we'll keep quiet about that uh, and, and we'll go looking to win some kudos by backing popular causes. This is leading us into some pretty difficult areas. And an old friend of yours, Tiki Fullerton's here tonight, and I think she's got a very important question about it. Two of my favourite thinkers. Um, yes, Neil, just on this subject, and as John says, um, at a time when big business, certainly here, elsewhere, has, has lost trust, what do you make of this latest pressure on huge investment companies, uh, superannuation, to then put pressure on big business, company boards to change. We've seen this, and, and in the context of the culture wars, we've seen this with Climate Action 100 Plus and Glencore, and it will happen to others. We've seen this with diversity, and they've been very successful. And as you will have noticed in the last couple of days, there's some alarm about uh, industry super now with union representations on boards, but much more broadly than unions, that the AOCs of this world will move in a world where wealth inequalities could be the, the next big moral challenge of our time, will move to go directly to these big investment companies to push for wage hikes. Thanks, Tiki. Well, it, uh I should have known that you'd ask a really difficult question. Um, uh, Tiki and I were at Oxford together uh, hardly any time ago, uh, just you know, a few years ago, and um, it's, it's lovely to see, see you again here. And I, I, I'm conscious that something quite institutionally peculiar has happened in Australia, namely that you've accumulated these these funds, the unions have representation on them, and they're clearly going to be playing a political part and leaning heavily on, on Australian corporations. This is somewhat unusual. Typically, if you're a large American company, you're more terrified of a hedge fund activist than you are terrified of a trade union activist. Um, so the story is somewhat different in the United States, but not wholly different, because what you're describing here is a general phenomenon whereby campus politics spreads out of the campus and into the marketplace. And it does this in a number of different ways. It does it within corporations because they hire people who've been educated and 
Berkeley and Stanford and they start to take their campus politics into the workplace. Uh, but what also happened on campuses in the last 10 or more years was uh, successful campaigns by uh, the student left to force the university endowments, the, the source of, of uh, the wealth of American universities, to divest from this or that, whichever particular industry they decided they didn't like. And I think this is really where this began. The idea that you can politicize the investment process. And once you figured out how to do that for, oh, I don't know, I guess it kind of got going with apartheid South Africa, then it kind of spread more widely into, oh, don't invest in fossil fuels. Don't invest in the arms industry. Stop, don't invest in Israel. And once you've kind of got the habit of forcing people to make investment decisions on the basis of whatever the fashionable uh, issue of the day is, uh, then this can become a major problem uh, for corporations. Now, corporations are not, by and large, run by courageous people. Uh, when they get to a certain size, they're run by bureaucrats. The entrepreneurs have long left the scene. And the bureaucrats who are kind of busy dealing with like all the different things that come up if you're running a corporation have their corporate PR people. And they are the most risk averse people in the world. And when those people sense uh, anything that could be uh, negative headlines, their first reaction is to capitulate. Uh, and that, I think, is a really important factor here. It's not just that there will be pressure. Yeah, there'll be pressure, just as there'll be pressure from activist uh, shareholders. What is dis distinguishing here is the tendency for large corporations to fold when they come under that kind of pressure, instead of arguing back and, and challenging these uh, increasingly politicized forms of pressure. So I think that's the way to think about this. I, I, I guess there's something very distinctive about the Australian institutional structure, but it's not that different from what's going on. The other way in which you see corporations dealing with this problem is virtue signaling. So virtue signaling is a kind of very uh, standard response where you say, yeah, we hear what you're saying, but how would you like to look at our animal rights program? Uh, how would you like to uh, listen to our, our philanthropic story? Uh, would you like to hear all that we are doing for, you mentioned it, diversity? So the kind of standard feature uh, of corporate uh, response is uh, a smokescreen of virtue uh, in the hope that nobody will will necessarily scrutinize the specific investment or employment decisions. And I think when it comes to, to demands for higher wages, that, that may well be what ensues. Uh, because if you start folding on wages, um, then it's good by margins and it's good by stock price. And I, you know, I'm enough of a believer in the, the discipline of financial markets to think that any company that is so ready to fold that it just decides to destroy its own business model isn't going to isn't going to last long or at least the ceo isn't isn't going to last long so the correct response is do not fold but do some virtue signaling they usually buy it <laughs> all right if we can shift gears from the things that are challenging us from within if i can put it that way in our western democracies uh, let's come to the one that's You've been talking about a lot here in Australia, uh, the, uh, and we talked about uh, you saw it as a second major threat to, uh, to our, uh, uh, our way of life, the relationship between the superpower and the rising superpower. Uh, first question in my mind might be that China's staggering economic growth plainly has been critically important to its rising status in the world, to its intention to, as it self-confesses, uh, to at least rival the America, uh, the, the power of the Americans. Can they keep that economic growth that's so critical to their desire to be powerful in the world, including militarily going? Possibly, but it gets harder with each year. Uh, at the moment, to meet a, a growth target above 6%, uh, China has had to revert to uh, increased uh, credit creation. Uh, this is going to be a, a reversal of, of some importance because last year uh, 
the talk was all about deleveraging, and now it turns out that to keep growth up above 6%, you have to re-leverage, and there's been a sudden increase of so-called uh, social finance. So I think they can keep growth going at above 6%, but it gets harder and harder, and it requires uh, ever larger uh, piles of debt. Where that leads is unclear because China's not got a financial system like Australia or the United States. It's, uh, it's a, a closed system with capital controls. Uh, the state controls the banks. And therefore, we shouldn't anticipate a 2008-style financial crisis in China. But it's clear that at some point, something's got to give. I incline to the view that there won't be a China crisis. I think people who have been predicting that for the last 10 or 20 years have been disappointed. I think you get a China slowdown. And there comes a point at which the demographics overwhelm the leverage. China's workforce is shrinking. The principal source of China's growth was a large-scale migration of a growing working population into the cities and into industry. That game is over. Between now and the end of the century, the working population will actually shrink by up to 200 million people. Uh, and under those conditions, I think China is bound to end up in a more Japanese-like situation of much lower growth and uh, me meaningful deflation. So that's where we're heading. And I don't think there is a policy in the world that can keep China growing at 6% beyond a few years from now. Th that growth rate is coming down with a kind of inexorable uh, gravitational force, which is probably a good thing um, for a whole bunch of reasons, including the environmental reasons. I mean, oh, you can have all the Green New Deals in the world, in the Western world. Uh, you can stop growth dead in Australia and in the United States. It doesn't matter at all for the climate uh, issue if China continues to, uh, to pollute on the scale that it currently does. So one thing that would be kind of good would be if China slowed down. The question that you raised, though, John, is, is, is not just economic, it's geopolitical. Even if China's growth slows down to low single digits, even if its growth rate falls down to Japanese levels over the next 10 or, or 20 years, it's still, by at least one measure, a larger economy than the US, and it might well end up being, by a current dollar measure, a larger economy uh, than the US. Kei Yujin uh, was in town yesterday, Chinese uh, uh, economist uh, based at the London School of Economics, but a, a, a PRC citizen, and she said it's inevitable that we will be number one, and maybe that's right. What does that mean for the world? Because there's never been a bigger economy than the United States since the 1880s. Uh, the Soviet Union never got close, nor did Japan, nor did West Germany. I think this is a huge question, because if China's not only economically number one, but increasingly able to compete with the United States in the realm of military capability, in the realm of technology, in particular in the realm of artificial intelligence, potentially in the realm of quantum computing, then we are in a new world. Uh, and that new world is one that I, I find many people are in denial about because they would like to believe that what I called more than 10 years ago now, Chimerica, is still in business. Now, in 2007, Chimerica was real. China plus America was the key to the world economy. It was a symbiotic relationship. The Chinese did the saving and the Americans did the consuming. The Chinese did the exporting and the Americans did the importing. But the argument of that original Chimerica piece was, was a pun. It was a chimera. This wasn't sustainable. And, and sure enough, Chimerica wasn't sustainable. It's now falling apart. And it's falling apart not just because of the trade war that, that President Trump began, but because of a bunch of other reasons. So I think the question that we really confront now is, are we on the threshold of a new Cold War? Because this rivalry between two now roughly the same size economies, which is also ideological because, let's face it, all hopes that the Chinese were going to liberalise politically have been dashed. That seems to me to be the really interesting, the really interesting question for 2019, and it's a very troubling question for Australia. And on that question, Marcus has a question.
uh, Marcus, on that issue. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for coming tonight. Um, so in recent times, Australia has assumed that America will defend our interests in the event of national conflict and has only spent modestly on defence. It now appears that this American defence capability and even willingness to help us may be severely reduced and at the same time, China's military might appears to be growing rapidly. Greg Sheridan has said that there is a national defect in our character and we should be taking defence much more seriously. Should Australia be taking more responsibility for protecting our own freedom? Yes. It's a great question. When one assesses China's defence spending, maybe defence is the wrong word. There's a very rapid uh, growth in China's offensive capability. China is for example, building up a missile capability that would pose a profound threat to US aircraft carrier groups in the event of a conflict. Uh, you're all familiar, and I hardly need to repeat it, with China's uh, construction of military facilities uh, uh, in the South China Sea. But there's a whole bunch of less visible stuff going on as China uh, invests in what in effect is a new generation of military capability. The drone swarm is going to be an important part of any future conflict and China has a, a natural edge given its capacity for building drones. So number one, there's no question that China's spending a lot on its military and to call it defence is to stretch the meaning of that. Term. Secondly, one characteristic feature of America first as a policy is that President Trump has not exactly been reassuring to uh, traditional US allies and the alliance system. It was a great source of concern uh, for both General McMaster, his former national security advisor, and General Mattis, his former defense secretary. They've gone. Uh, and I think one has to worry a little bit about how uh, firm the resolve of the United States would be towards any of its allies uh, in the face uh, of a conflict. So when you put those two things together, Australia can hardly be complacent about its security. Look, let's just do some basic history here. History is mostly the history of empires not actually the history of nation states and it's mostly the history of conflict not the history of peace. You get peaceful periods, no question. We've been in a relatively peaceful time uh, since the end of the Cold War but to assume that this will continue indefinitely would be to ignore the lessons of history. Another obvious lesson of history which has been true throughout the centuries is that if you want peace prepare for war and vice versa. If you want war, act like it'll never come. Allow your defense capability to atrophy. For an enormous island that is thinly populated in relative terms compared with Asia, that has a vast store of natural resources, for such an island to be ill-defended seems like the most spectacular historical folly. In particular, when it is in relatively close proximity to a one-party state with obviously imperial ambitions, and it's quite a long way away from its principal ally. That China has imperial ambitions is obvious. The more Chinese leaders in their speeches say, Oh, China never does conquest. The more I'm like, seriously? Are you really going to make that argument? I mean, the Qing Empire was taking great chunks of Russia just over a century ago. So let's get real here. This is not a good situation. It was okay during the Chimerican era when the Chinese were like, okay, it's no problem, we'll just sell you stuff cheaply and underpay our workers and lend you money, it's cool. 
we'll buy Australian stuff, not a problem, market price, how much do you want? That was all fine. But anybody who thought that that was going to last indefinitely was dreaming. Because the whole point of Chamarica was that it was a temporary, illusory relationship. And that at some point, China wouldn't need it anymore. And the Chinese are kind of getting to the point where they don't need it anymore. And the bets that we placed from the Clinton era that they would liberalize or that the internet would somehow turn them into a democracy, all that's gone. China's actually gone in the opposite direction politically. Xi Jinping has increased the central control of the party, is reimposing doctrinal orthodoxy, is cutting out such free speech as had developed uh, in China's public square. I mean, how many more flashing red lights do you need? So I think this is kind of getting to the point of urgent. And what I see in Australian politics is a debate that if it was going on in a regional council in Scotland would seem parochial. The parochialism is stunning. True. A considerable effort's been made by the intelligence and national security community in this country to waken people up to the potential threat that Australia faces. But is, is Australia in any way prepared, from a naval point of view, for a Chinese act of aggression? No way. So I think this is a moment of truth, actually. I said yesterday that we were entering a new Cold War and we should stop pretending otherwise. That's right. And this Cold War will be very different from the last Cold War. It will be fought in different ways. It will be a, an arms race for everything from artificial intelligence to quantum computing, more than for nuclear weapons or rockets to the moon. And the battlefields will be different. When you consider what China's Belt and Road Initiative has become, it is nothing less than Weltpolitik, than a global policy, it's far extended beyond the original concept that was essentially a Central Asian Indian Ocean concept, and it's become global. And the search for commodities is not a trivial part of what is involved. Empires, at some level, are about acquiring commodities at below market prices. That's kind of what empires are or at least not trusting to the market to deliver you the commodities so it's better to own the real estate and own the mines, control the supply chain and not be at the mercy of the market or the mercy of a navy, which China currently is, the US Navy. So we need to clearly understand the historical logic of China's expansion. To have security, China cannot be dependent on imported commodities and market prices. When you think about what that implies for Australia, it's really quite scary because Australia is a prize. Australia is a hugely attractive place from a Chinese vantage point and not just as a vacation destination or a place to study and learn English. And I'm stunned by the lack of awareness of the strategic vulnerability of Australia when everything should be screaming to you, prepare. I think we'd all agree that's extremely sobering. It's worth noting that Australia only became a nation in 1901. The federal government of that time read what was happening in Europe better, I think, than the Europeans did, realised trouble was coming. And in 1907, just six years after we became a nation, they ordered what, was, what could be described as a Tier 2 Navy from the Brits. It arrived here just five years later. By way of contrast, in 2009 it was decided and generally agreed as a matter of national urgency we needed 12 new state-of-the-art submarines. By the time the first one is delivered, It'll be 25 years from that decision, at the earliest. That is the length of time that eclipsed, that elapsed between the beginning of the First World War and the end of the Second World War. Thank you. I have to say to you, I believe that's a very, very timely warning to us all.
On this, uh, this question of the technological race, you've been talking about AI. Uh, there's a debate going on about whether, in fact, the Americans might not have lost out already to the Chinese in that race. But to feed into a specific, we're starting to understand the extraordinary control the Chinese communists are now exercising over their people, including the deployment of very sophisticated technology to monitor their people. This horrendous idea, as it seems to me, of the social credit system, which is obviously a great user and deployer of technology, seems chilling. How should we understand it? Well, you're probably all familiar with what's happening in China, which is that the, the internet has enabled the Chinese government to have access to data about its citizens without parallel in the history of authoritarian regimes. And with the deployment of, of surveillance technology, cameras and facial recognition technology, uh, the government is edging towards having real-time coverage of its, its population's every move. The, the amazing thing that happened was that China was able to keep the American internet companies out, allow its own internet companies to flourish, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, create a, an extraordinarily vibrant ecosystem uh, in which Chinese citizens, uh, like their American counterparts, gave up their data to the network platforms. The difference being that the Chinese government was able to say to the network platforms, oh, that's interesting, we'd like to see that, and they can see it. And so what has happened is like this extraordinary variation on a theme by George Orwell. If you remember 1984, which you should all reread if you haven't read it recently, the telescreen is on the wall of every apartment and everything that Winston does is, is seen by the telescreen. But this is a very different kind of telescreen because we carry it around with us and we kind of volunteer for surveillance. Social credit is kind of beyond regular credit. Uh, your credit score is not just going to be, did you remember to pay the electricity bill? Your social credit it's, uh, score is going to be, were you a good citizen when it came to fill in the blank? Uh, did you, uh, in fact, uh, fully live up to the ideals of Xi Jinping thought? So this is kind of beyond 1984 because the level of surveillance is far greater. Uh, the ability of the citizen to behave outside the range of monitoring will be greatly limited. And we should all be scared about that because this is not something that necessarily stays in China. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, let's remember two things. Any regime that has so little confidence in its own people that it has to spend more money on domestic surveillance and policing than on defense is not strong. Secondly, totalitarianism, even with 20th century technology, failed. And although he didn't have facial recognition, Stalin pretty much had every Soviet citizen under as good surveillance because in the Soviet Union, you didn't really know if you'd been watched, but you really didn't want to take the chance that you were being watched. So even if you were completely alone in an empty room, you acted like you were being watched. I know, because I remember going there. So it's not like this is completely new. You acted in the Soviet Union as if you were being under permanent surveillance, just on the off chance that you were. And that system failed, it failed completely. It failed completely because human beings are not, in fact, designed to be under 24-7 surveillance by Big Brother or anybody else, Mark Zuckerberg for that matter. We are not supposed to be under that level of state control or corporate control. Dostoevsky's uh, Notes from Underground is a must read. So Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground is great because he says, Somehow, 
intuitively sensing where modernity is going, that we will be supposed to live under some timetabling so precise that our every move will be pre-calculated and, and, and foreseen. And, and, you know, it's an amazing thing for somebody to write in the middle of the 19th century, but it's like a vision of the future, a vision of the future under surveillance with AI anticipating our every move. And, and Dostoevsky says, no, 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 man will revolt against this. Man will insist on his right to do the irrational, on his right to defy uh, what became Big Brother. So I think while it's very chilling that the Chinese state is embarking on this enterprise, it will fail. Because all projects to achieve total central control of very large numbers of human beings fail. And they, and they fail because that is not how we are designed by evolution to operate. We're actually designed to operate in relatively freewheeling, smallish networks. Actually, we're quite close to the Dunbar number here tonight, which is the right number of people. We could all get to know one another and we could quite effectively cooperate together to solve all of Australia's problems. <laughs> Um, that's kind of how we're designed. Um, and, you know, we've sat here in these nice leather armchairs, very much my kind of armchair, and we've been the kind of guys on the platform, but we've, you know, we, we, we could have a very much more informal dialogue or we could actually swap it out and have a couple of you come up here. That's, that's how we're kind of designed. The failure to understand that is surely why Marxist theory is wrong. It wasn't yeah. just the practice. No, totally, the theory's wrong, that the, the concept of... That people would give their loyalty to the state ahead of... Or the party. The loyalty is to the party. And the notion that you are going to have... But a, ahead of a, their personal... Right, yeah, their, this, their, is their, not, this is not really uh, ever going to work. So I'm ultimately confident uh, that we will, and this, this, this may apply to Australia as well as to the United States, we will do the right thing when all the alternatives have been exhausted and... At the same time, our adversaries, because their fundamental model is flawed, will not prevail. This is going to be a very different 10 years from the last 10 years. The next 10 years are going to surprise us in a lot of ways, uh, not least the, the technological innovations that lie ahead. But I think we shouldn't lose sight of the lessons of the 20th century. It is not likely that highly centralized systems prevail over relatively decentralized systems. That is not the lesson of the 20th century. So although I was somewhat somber earlier in, in, in warning Australia not to be complacent, I, I want to end on a, on a relatively optimistic note. The free society wins. Freedom works. It, it was the great insight of the Enlightenment that free speech, free thought, are superior to central control, to unthinking obedience to authority. What we must not do, and this brings us back to where we began our conversation, John, what we mustn't do is kill off the real strengths that distinguish Western civilization, yes, there I said it, <laughs> from its historic enemies. The things that distinguish it make it special are that openness, that readiness to compete, to challenge one another, to challenge our ideas, that ability to say things that are contrarian, may even seem heretical. That's been the secret sauce. That's the real killer app. And as long as we remain true to that and don't allow various elements within our own society to shut down free thought and free speech, then we shall be fine. We can screw it up along the way. That's definitely been part of our history. But we have an ultimate edge over an unfree society. The open society will defeat the closed society as long as the open society doesn't become closed itself. Well, Neil, that answered the second issue that I was going to raise, which was a, a young person who's here tonight said to me before uh, we came in, can you give us hope? Can you give us encouragement? We who see the dangers want to make a difference, but it's very hard. You've just answered that question. So you've been very generous with your time.
you've imparted an enormous amount of wisdom. I'm amazed at how many people are listening to these conversations on podcasts and one of the things that keeps us going in, in making them uh, and, and enjoying this conversation is the number of young people who come back to us and say how fantastic it is to be able to hear a range of views. Uh, and yours tonight is your range of views and what you've given us has been unbelievably valuable and enormously appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.